Okay, so hi everyone and welcome back. What we're gonna be doing today is wrapping up our lecture on conservation of energy. And so by the end of this video, we're gonna be completely done with the content from chapter eight of the textbook that we needed to cover. So the last topic that we're gonna get into is gravitational potential energy. Okay, so gravitational potential energy is something that we have encountered already, and we've talked about it to some extent, but there's a lot more to say about it. So far, we've been focusing on objects that stay near the surface of the Earth, okay? So when we have an object that stays near the surface of the Earth, we can treat the force of gravity as if it's constant, as if it doesn't change even when the object moves up or down a little bit. And this is a really good approximation as long as h, which we can think of as the height of the object above the surface of the Earth, is a lot, lot less than the radius of the Earth. So in everyday situations, of course, the height that objects have above the surface of the Earth is much less than the radius. I mean, think about even something on the top of a very tall building. It's only a couple hundred meters up above the surface of the Earth. That would be h. On the other hand, the radius of the Earth is something like 6,400 kilometers. So it's way bigger than that height, which means the force of gravity can be treated as a constant. And in that case, we have this formula that we're familiar with, where Fg, the force of gravity, is equal to m, the mass of the object, times g, where g is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. And from that, we derived that the gravitational potential energy is given by mgh, where m and g are again the same as they were in the previous equation, and h is the height above the surface of the Earth. So that works perfectly well as long as you're staying pretty close to the surface of the Earth. But in reality, the force of gravity decreases with distance. So if I get really, really far away from the surface of the Earth, I'm gonna to start to notice that the force of gravity is getting smaller. So if I wanna describe a situation like that, then I need a more general expression for gravitational potential energy. In other words, MGH is not gonna cut it for objects out there in space somewhere, okay? And we want a formula that describes that, so we're gonna to have to take this a little bit further. Okay, so if we want to describe the force of gravity in a way that applies generally and not just when we have um, an object close to the surface of the Earth, we need to look at Newton's law of universal gravitation. So the statement is that every particle in the universe attracts every other particle with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their separation. Okay, so in the equation, m1 and m2 represent the two different masses, and R represents the separation between the two masses. So the force of gravity, if we write this in an equation, is going to be proportional to the product of the masses, so M1 and M2 should be on top. Inversely proportional to the square of the separation means R squared is on the bottom, and then we'll have to have some kind of constant out front. That's big G. That's our constant of proportionality. And by the way, big G is equal to 6.67, 10 to the minus 11, newtons times meters squared per kilogram squared. So using this equation, you can describe the force of gravity between any two masses. And again, this works in general. We're not making any assumptions. This just always works. The last thing to say about this is that when we describe the force, we need to remember it's an attractive force, meaning Let's say I look at uh, mass number one. The force that it's gonna feel is towards mass number two. So this says F21. That means the force that mass number two exerts on mass number one. It's to the right, it's attracted to mass number two. If we look at this force, it says F12. That's the force that one exerts onto two. That's pulling it this way to the left. Again, it's an attractive force. So with that said, we can take that formula for the force, okay, given by Newton's law of universal gravitation, and we can calculate the potential energy function 
for that force, okay? So remember, whenever we come up with a potential energy function, we have to say what the zero point is gonna be, okay? So at the outset, we're gonna set the zero point for gravitational potential energy to be when the objects are separated by an infinite distance, okay? So R going to infinity means M1 and M2 are separated by an infinite distance. That's where we're gonna put the zero point. In other words, gravitational potential energy, when R is equal to infinity, should be zero. That's how we'll set the zero point. Okay, so I just wanna remind you how this works. How is it that we get a potential energy function starting with a force? So the way it works is delta U, change in potential energy, is given by minus the work. In this case, we're dealing with gravity, so I'll put a little G subscript uh, on each one of those just to remind us. And so that's gonna be our starting point. But to really make it clear what we're doing here, let's draw a picture, where M1 is located here, and M2 is somewhere to the right of that. And we can keep track of where everything is using this axis, let's call it the x-axis. And what we're gonna say is x equals zero is where M1 is located. We're also not gonna let M1 move. M1 is gonna be fixed, but we'll let M2 move around. So you can imagine M1 is kind of nailed down right there at x equals zero but M2 gets to move around, okay? So what is the force acting on M2? Well, that's gonna be an attractive force. So it's gonna be pointing towards M1 to the left. And that's our force Fg right there. The other thing we should think about is if we're gonna move M2 Outwards, we're going to move it away from N1, actually until the point where it gets infinitely far away. Then we're moving it this way, to the right. So our displacement, dr, a little bit of displacement that we give to M2 as we move it, is pointing to the right. Okay. So that looks good so far. By the way, um, x initial for this mass M2, I'm just gonna call that R. So R can be whatever you want. But X final is gonna be infinity. So in other words, I'm moving M2 outwards to an infinite distance. Uh, from M1. Okay, that's, that's the idea. So we're gonna start here and then move M2 out until it's infinitely far away from M1. All right then, so let's think about how to calculate the work done by gravity. How would that go? Well, um, I would take the force of gravity dotted with dr, so force dot displacement, and I'd basically just have to go from the initial position to the final position as my limits of integration. That's how I would calculate the work done by gravity. Okay. So R initial to R final. How do I describe the force of gravity? Well, it has a negative sign attached to it because it's pointing in the negative X direction. Okay, it's pointing to the left. But the force itself is G times M1 times M2 divided by the distance between these two guys. I'm just choosing to call that distance X. So X squared on the bottom, again, just represents the distance. And then the I hat unit vector tells us uh, that we're along the X axis with this vector. Okay. Now I have DR. Well, dx represents a little bit of distance I move on the x-axis. And if I put an i-hat unit vector next to that, again, that just tells me the direction I'm going in, it's the x direction. So to clean all that up, just remember that i-hat dot 
i hat is equal to 1. And we have some constants in the integral that we can pull out. We have minus g. We have m1 and m2. Those are all constant. And then all we're left with is dx on the top and x squared on the bottom. And as for the limits, well, remember, we're calling the initial position r. And the final position is infinity. So those are the limits of integration that we specified at the beginning. OK. So another way you can think about this is g times m1 times m2. x to the minus 2 is what we're integrating. And we're doing it from r to infinity. So to figure out the integral of x to the minus 2, we can just use the power rule. So the constants out front, just copy those down. x to the minus 2 integrates to minus x to the minus 1. So you raise the power by 1, and then you get negative 1, but then you have to divide by that, which brings a negative sign out front. That's how that worked. And we go from r to infinity. OK, so here, there, there are two negative signs. Just cancel those out for simplicity. We have g, m1, m2, and then we have uh, x to the minus 1, which is 1 over x. The top limit is infinity, so 1 over infinity. Bottom limit is 1 over r. And keep in mind that as we take um, this to infinity, uh, 1 over infinity goes to 0. So in other words, what we're left with is minus g m1 m2 divided by r. OK, cool. So that's the work done during this process. So to get potential energy, we have delta u, which is the gravitational potential energy at infinity, because that's where we end up minus the gravitational potential energy at r, that's where we start, that should equal the negative of this work, right? It's minus the work. So what we had for the work was minus g m1 m2 over r. Just change that to plus g m1 m2 over r. And then we'll just remember that we set the zero point to infinity. So that means the first term, the gravitational potential energy at infinity, is something I can just set to zero. OK, so this is tricky. There are a lot of minus signs floating around. But the final answer for the gravitational potential energy is going to be minus g m1 m2 over r, because I'm just moving this minus sign over to the other side. So that's the answer. In general, this is how you want to think about gravitational potential energy, uh, not just near Earth's surface, but in general. OK, so what we found is, using the definition of potential energy, that delta U is equal to minus W, we did some work, we did some integration, and we found that gravitational potential energy is given by minus G M1 M2 divided by R. And remember, R represents the distance between the two objects. And in particular, if we're dealing with large objects like a sun or a moon or a planet, you want to take R to mean the distance between the centers of those two objects. So the center to center distance is what R represents in this equation. So with that said, let's do an example. A ball is dropped from a height of two radii above the surface of the moon. What is the speed of the ball in meters per second just before it hits the moon? We're going to assume that there is no air resistance as the ball falls down. To do this, we're going to use conservation of mechanical energy. OK, so the radius of the moon is going to be capital R. What this is saying is that Twice that radius, 2 times capital R, is the starting height of the ball above the surface of the moon. 
By the way, the radius of the moon, capital R, is 1.74 times 10 to the 6 meters. The mass of the moon, which is something we're going to need to know, is 7.35 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. And then G, which is the gravitational constant, is 6.67 10 to the minus 11 newtons times meters squared over kilograms squared. So let's work this out. Okay, so we'll start by just listing some things that we know. The initial state of the system we're looking at is the ball is dropped. So we can say something about the initial speed of that ball. It will be zero because it starts from rest. And the initial value of R, which is the separation between the center of the moon and the basketball, well, that would be three times the radius of the moon. So the idea would be we have one moon radius to get from the center to the surface of the moon, and then two more uh, factors of R to get to where the basketball is. Okay, so in total, 3R from the center. Final state looks like this. The ball is just about to hit the surface of the moon. So we can say something about V final. We don't know what that is. The whole point is to find it. But R final would just be one factor of big R. So in other words, at the moment we hit the surface of the moon here, the distance between the basketball and the center of the moon is just the radius. Okay. So we don't have any non-conservative forces doing work on the basketball. Therefore, mechanical energy is conserved. And we can do this uh, by putting the energies in a table. So we have kinetic and we have potential, in particular gravitational potential to think about. And we can look at the initial state of our system and the final state. Okay, so initial kinetic energy is zero because, again, the ball is not moving yet. The final would be one-half mv final squared. And uh, just so we're clear, what I'm going to do is I'm going to label the moon as big M, and I'm going to label the basketball as little m. So to show that the basketball has kinetic energy in the final state, it's one-half little m times v squared. Okay. Now, let's remember how gravitational potential energy works. We just derived this. This is minus g times m1, m2 divided by little r. But I'm going to write this as big M, little m. Okay, big M is the moon, little m is the basketball. So in the initial state, my gravitational potential energy is minus g, big M times little m divided by three times the radius of the moon, so three times big R. And then in the final state, minus G, big M, little m, divided by big R. Okay? So the initial energy, initial mechanical energy of the system is equal to the final. That's what it means to be conserved. And so our equation, if we take the total for the initial column here, all we have is minus g, big M, little m, over 3r. If we add up the final column here, that should be equal to 1 half little m, v final squared, minus big G, big M, little m, divided by big R. Okay, so let's simplify this thing a little bit. First, we can cancel out little m. That's the mass of the basketball. And I want to solve for v. So 1 half v final squared is equal to, uh, so I'm going to move this term, this third term, over to the other side of the equation, which makes it positive, gm over r, and then we have minus 3gm over r. 
which by the way is equal to, um, or sorry, the, the three's on the bottom, I should say. So GM over three R is what I meant to say. So if you take one minus a third, that's two thirds. So two GM over three R is how you'd want to think about that. And then if we just multiply by two on both sides, we're gonna have V final squared is equal to four GM over three R. So V final is the square root of four times big G, which is 6.67, 10 to the minus 11, Newtons times meters squared divided by kilograms squared. Now we plug in big M, which is the mass of the moon, 7.35, 10 to the 22 kilograms. And then we divide by three times the radius of the moon, which is 1.74, 10 to the six meters. Okay, so numerically what you're getting is 1,938, but we'll round that to uh, three sig figs in this case. And we expect the units to be coming out in meters per second because that's our SI unit for speed, but let's just verify that it works that way. Okay, so units. It looks like we have newtons times meters squared divided by kilograms squared, but then we multiply by kilograms on the top, and then we divide by meters, and then we take the square root of all that. So to simplify, I have newtons, I have meters on top because one factor cancels. Uh, I have kilograms on the bottom and then square root that. Then we'll remember that a newton is the same as a kilogram times a meter per second squared. So then we have meters divided by kilograms in addition to that. Kilograms cancel. What we're left with is the square root of meters squared divided by seconds squared, which is meters per second. Okay, so I'm just verifying that the units work out in the way I think. But a general rule is if you put the units in SI inside of your calculation, SI units will pop out of your calculation. So that just verifies that this works. Anyway, to round this off to the right number of sig figs, we'll round it up to... Um, 1,940 meters per second, or we could say 1.94 kilometers per second. That's how fast the basketball is moving before it hits the surface of the moon. Okay, so let's do another example where we get to use this new formula for gravitational potential energy. And that is where we move a satellite from one orbit around the Earth to a further out orbit around the Earth, okay? So we're going to consider a uh, 1,550 kilogram satellite, that's this thing, that is in circular orbit around the Earth with an altitude of 408 kilometers. So what that means is the height of this uh, satellite above the surface of the Earth is 408 kilometers. You want to move the satellite to a different orbit uh, with an altitude of 905 kilometers. So that would be the larger one up here. How much work must be done on the satellite in units of joules in order to achieve this, in order to move the satellite from here to here? The way we're going to be solving this is by using the formula work non-conservative is equal to delta K plus delta U. So let me explain a little bit where this equation comes into play. So the satellite is going to have kinetic energy because it's certainly moving in a circular orbit around the Earth, so that motion has kinetic energy K associated with it. It has potential energy due to the height above the Earth. That's U. But if we're gonna move it from one orbit to another, basically we're gonna have to fire some rockets and move it out that way by firing some thruster rockets, okay? And those are doing some work. Those rockets will be doing some work, which it turns out is non-conservative and that's what we're gonna be calculating here. So what's gonna go into the calculation is the radius of the Earth, which is 6,370 kilometers. The mass of the Earth, which is 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, 
And then again, the constant g that we've seen before. So let's work this out. Okay, so we're calculating the work needed to move the satellite. And the way we'll think about it is WNC, work done by non-conservative forces acting on the satellite, is equal to delta K, change in kinetic energy plus delta U, change in potential. But remember, K plus U is just equal to the total energy. So we can equivalently think of this as delta E. So the work needed to move the satellite is just the change in mechanical energy of the satellite. That's the idea. Okay, so if the mechanical energy is K plus U, the kinetic piece is one half MV squared. So that's gonna encapsulate the kinetic energy of the satellite. The potential energy is gonna be given by minus G, big M little m divided by R. So we're, we're using the same kind of notation where big M represents the Earth, little m represents the satellite, okay? Okay, so the next thing we want to do is think about the fact that we're in a circular orbit at any given time. So little m, the satellite, is moving in a circular path like this. And it's feeling a force of gravity that attracts it to the Earth. So we can apply Newton's second law, F equals ma, to this little satellite. And in particular, we can do it in the radial direction because we're dealing with circular motion. So there's only one force we need to think about, which is gravity. The force of gravity is given by g. Remember, the product of the two masses is big M, little m. We're talking about force here, not energy. So R squared is on the bottom. So remember, for energy, it's just R on the bottom. For uh, force, it's R squared on the bottom. And the other side of the equation is the mass of the satellite times the acceleration. Well, since it's going in a circle, the acceleration is given by V squared over R. It's called our centripetal acceleration. And so we can cancel out little m, we can also cancel out one factor of r. So what we're left with is v squared is equal to big G, big M divided by r. Okay? So in my energy equation then, I have one half times little m times v squared. I'm going to replace v squared with big G, big M divided by r because I just calculated what that is. And then I have minus big G, big M, uh, little m divided by R for the potential energy. And overall, what we have is this, okay? Think of this as a half minus one, which gives you minus one half. Big G, big M, little m divided by two R. Again, that's the minus one-half factor I was talking about. That's how we think about the total energy of the satellite. Okay, so therefore, if work non-conservative is equal to delta E, that would just be E final, the energy of the satellite in the final orbit, minus E initial, the energy of the satellite in the initial orbit, which is just minus g big M little m divided by r final minus negative big G big M little m divided by r initial. So we can kind of grab these factors and write it in a more compact way. Oh, and I forgot my factor of two on the bottom. Sorry, don't forget that factor of two on the bottom. So overall out front, we have a factor of big G big M little m divided by two. And then we have 1 over r initial minus 1 over r final. 
And again, we'll just remember that R is the distance from the center of the Earth. So the distance of the satellite from Earth's uh, center. But anyway, now we have all the numbers we need, and we have the formula. So we can plug everything in. We have big G is 6.67, 10 to the minus 11, newtons times meters squared divided by kilograms squared. Big M is the mass of the Earth. That's 5.97, 10 to the 24 kilograms. Little m is the mass of the satellite, 1,550 uh, kilograms. And then we're dividing that by 2. Then we're multiplying that by 1 over r initial. So remember, we're talking the distance from Earth's center here. So the radius of the Earth is 6,370 kilometers. But I'd have to add to that the initial uh, altitude, which is 408. Um, that's how many kilometers from the center of the Earth we are initially in the starting orbit. I'd want to multiply that by 10 to the 3 to get this in units of meters, because again, we started in kilometers. And then I would next subtract 1 divided by our final, which again is the final distance from the center of the Earth. So we'd have to take the radius, 6,370, plus 905 uh, to get how many kilometers from the center we are at the uh, end of this. And then again, times 10 to the 3 converts that to meters. So that's a lot to type into your calculator, but you can do that. And what you'll get is 3.1104 times 10 to the 9 and we'll keep three sig figs on that. What kind of units do we have? Well, we've got newtons out front. Now kilograms will cancel because I have kilograms squared and then two factors of kilograms here. Um, meters squared, one of those factors is gonna cancel with meters on the bottom. So we're left with newtons times meters, but that's the same as joules, okay? A newton times a meter is a joule. So we have 3.11 10 to the 9 joules. That's how much work we would have to do to move the satellite to the new orbit. Okay, so next we're going to move on to escape speed. So here's what I want you to be thinking about. Imagine you have a ball and you throw it up into the air. We know, of course, that it will reach a maximum height and then come back down. If you take the same ball and you throw it up even faster than before, it will reach a maximum height that was bigger than before and then come back down. So could you throw the ball fast enough up into the air so that it never comes back down? There is no maximum height. It just keeps moving away from the earth forever. That's what we call escape speed. Okay. So the escape speed is the minimum speed an object must have to escape the gravitational influence of a massive body. So let's be really clear about what we're talking about here. This assumes that once the object is launched, the only force that acts on it is gravity. So you launch a small object that I'll call little m from the surface of a big object, I'll call that big M. You can imagine this is a, a planet or a moon or something like that. And it's just a one-shot thing. You just throw it into the air with some initial speed, and then you hope that it never comes back. So after you throw it into the air, there's not a rocket propelling it forward. There's no air resistance. The only force acting on it after it's launched into the air is gravity. That's the assumption. So we're going to work out a formula for the escape speed. And the way we're going to do it is by considering this initial state, which again is the small object, little m, is launched from the surface of the big object. And the distance between the two would just be the radius r of the big object. Okay, so what I'm saying here is little r, the separation between the two, is just equal to big R, which is the radius of the object. Okay, in the final state, we want 
the little object and the big object to get infinitely far away from each other. So the distance now is infinity, okay? That's the only way we can escape the gravitational influence of the big object is if we get infinitely far away. So using that, we're gonna derive a formula for the escape speed. Okay, so the initial state of our system is the object is launched upwards And let's assume that it's launched at exactly the escape speed because that's what we want to find. So V initial is the escape speed. R initial, the initial separation between this object we're launching into the air and the massive body that it's located on is equal to the radius of that massive body. Then in the final state, the object gets infinitely far away. Okay, so what we can say is um, the final value of R, the final separation between the two bodies is infinity. What about the, uh, the final speed? What should we say about that? Okay, well, V final can really be anything But the smallest value V final could have would be zero. So what you want to imagine is as this object gets infinitely far away, it slows down and it slows down till the point where it coasts to zero speed. That's the idea. So we have a table we can write down, um, just like in previous problems, where we have kinetic and potential energies for the system. And again, we can look at the initial state and the final state. So K is 1 half mv squared. Remember that. And then U, gravitational potential energy, is minus G, big M, little m, divided by R. Okay, so initial kinetic energy would be one half m v escape squared. The final kinetic energy would be zero if we're assuming the final speed is going to zero. Okay, what about initial potential energy? We have minus big G, big M times little m divided by big R, where that is the radius of the massive object. But in the final uh, state, we have zero, because here, if you take r to infinity, and that's in the denominator, the potential energy is going to go to zero. So therefore, if we use conservation of mechanical energy, E initial is equal to E final. Well, in the initial column, I have 1 half times little m times V escape squared minus big G, big M, little m divided by the radius, and that equals zero because the final column, I just have zero. All right, so let's uh, shuffle the terms around. 1 half MV escape squared is equal to positive big G, big M, little m divided by R. Cancel out little m, that goes away. Also, let's multiply on both sides by two. So V escape is what we get when we square root that. So it's the square root of two big G, big M divided by R. That's the speed you need to launch something into the air from the surface of a massive body where the mass is m and the radius is r uh, in order for it to escape and never come back down. So if you launch it with that escape speed, 
It just goes forever and it never comes back down. So we're gonna use the formula for escape speed. V escape is the square root of two big G, big M divided by R. And we're gonna apply it to the earth. So neglecting air resistance, with what minimum initial speed would you have to throw a ball into the air such that it escapes earth's gravitational pull? So in other words, we throw it into the air fast enough so that it never comes back down. It just keeps going away from the earth forever. So we're gonna use the following measurements Again, the constant big G is given here, the radius of the Earth, 6,370 kilometers, and the mass of the Earth, 5.97, 10 to the 24 kilograms. So take a minute, pause the video, see if you can get the calculation right, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so this is a very straightforward application of V escape is the square root of two big G, big M divided by R. So let's plug in what we know. G is 6.67, 10 to the minus 11. Uh, we have newtons times meters squared divided by kilograms squared here. The mass of the earth is 5.97, 10 to the 24. Units here are kilograms. And then we have the radius of the earth, which we're given that in kilometers as 6,370, but we'd have to convert that to meters by just doing 10 to the third. Again, a kilometer is 10 to the three meters. And so if you do the calculation, you're gonna get 11,181 units come out to meters per second. And of course, we want to round this to three sig figs. So 11,200 meters per second or 11.2 kilometers per second. That's really fast, okay? That's something like six-ish miles every second, okay? So you're, you have to throw the ball with an incredibly enormous speed to get it to escape, um, which is why that's quite difficult. Okay. So we can use the formula that we derived for the escape speed, and we can apply it to a really interesting case, which is black holes. So you may have heard of black holes before. These are objects that are so dense and their gravity is so strong that not even light can escape from them. So in a rough sense, you can say that black holes are defined by their escape velocity. In other words, at some distance away, from the black hole, the escape speed is equal to the speed of light. That's really what makes a black hole. And the speed of light is a fundamental constant of nature. It's given by the variable lowercase c. And c is equal to three times 10 to the eight meters per second. It's an incredibly fast speed. And in fact, it's really the maximum speed that anything can ever move with. If you study the theory of relativity, you'll learn that no object can ever move faster than the speed of light. So it really is the maximum speed or the speed limit of the universe. So, okay, if we take the escape speed and we set it equal to the speed of light, then we get C is equal to the square root of two times G times N uh, times M divided by R and we're gonna name that radius in the equation RS. It's a special radius which we'll call the Schwarzschild radius. What the Schwarzschild radius represents is the radius that you would have to crush an object down into so that the escape velocity at its surface is equal to C. In other words, you can take any object and if you crush it down into a small enough radius, you can create a black hole. As long as you crush it down to a small enough size you can create a black hole. So if we sort of flip this expression around and solve for RS, solve for the Schwarzschild radius, what we get is two times G times M divided by C squared. So again, that is the radius you would have to crush an object whose mass is M down into in order for it to become a black hole. And then just to give you a quick note on the history, uh, the Schwarzschild radius is named after Carl Schwarzschild, 
who discovered this formula as well as many other things dealing with gravity and black holes, all while he was fighting in World War I. So he was literally in the trenches in World War I, bullets flying all around him, and he was just casually sitting there working on these equations that describe black holes. Pretty amazing. Okay, so let's do a quick calculation uh, so we can use the equation we just derived for the Schwarzschild radius. And the question here is, what size would a person need to be crushed down into in order for them to become a black hole? So make an order of magnitude estimate that is round to the nearest power of 10. We just want to get the rough ballpark estimate of this number. Again, you're going to need to know G and the speed of light C to make the calculation. See what you get, pause the video, see what you get, and uh, then we'll go through it together. Okay, so we'll start with the formula for the Schwarzschild radius. Rs is equal to 2 times G times M divided by C squared. And we know that G and C are just constants uh, that we already know. So we have 2 times 6.67, 10 to the minus 11, that's G. Units are newtons times meters squared divided by kilograms squared. Now C is the speed of light. It's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and we square that. But we need to decide what mass to use. Okay, so different people have different masses, but I'll just choose my own mass. About 85 kilograms, it's about 190 pounds. So let's put that in there for M. 85 kilograms. And if you do the calculation, you'll get 1.25 times 10 to the minus 25 meters. And if we just want the rough order of magnitude, just get it in the right ballpark, that's about 10 to the minus 25 meters. So that is such a ridiculously small size that it's almost hard to wrap your head around. If we want to compare it to something that's really small, let's say the size of an atom, a typical atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters across. Okay, so what we're saying is in order to take a person and crush them down into a black hole, they would have to be crushed down to a size that is way smaller way, way smaller than the size of an atom, like 15 orders of magnitude smaller than the size of an atom. So that just sounds ridiculous on its face. How are you going to take something like a, the size of a person and crush it down into something that's much, much smaller than the size of an atom? That's the sort of thing that you'd have to do in order to make a black hole. It sounds impossible, but in fact, this can totally happen in the real world. Okay, so then the question for us is how do black holes actually form? And the short answer is a black hole can form when a dead star collapses in on itself. So let's kind of explain that picture a little bit. When you have a star, such as the sun, it maintains a balance throughout its lifetime between gravity, which tends to pull everything inwards, okay? Gravity kind of makes the star want to collapse in on itself. But there's also this outward pressure that's generated in the core of the star because in the core of every star you have what's called nuclear fusion going on. It's like you have millions of hydrogen bombs going off at the same time in the core of the star. That's what generates all this heat and light. It also pushes out and prevents gravity from making the star collapse. But the thing is, that fusion that's happening in the core, it can only happen for so long. Eventually, the star is going to run out of material to fuse together. And after that, you don't have this outward push anymore. You only have the inward pull of gravity. And so the star begins to collapse in on itself. It starts to collapse into a smaller size. So what happens when the star begins to collapse in on itself kind of depends on how big of a star you have. So if you have relatively low mass stars, something like four times the mass of the sun or less, the star will collapse in on itself, but it will stop eventually and become something that's called a white dwarf. So the white dwarf is sort of a remnant 
of a dead star. Okay, for even more massive stars, like four to eight times the mass of the sun, when the star collapses in on itself, it doesn't happen forever, it eventually stops and becomes something called a neutron star. So a white dwarf, and especially a neutron star, are super, super dense, but they're not black holes. They're not dense enough to be black holes. However, if you have a really high mass star, something like 10 times the mass of the sun about, if that collapses in on itself, nothing can stop it. It will collapse in on itself forever, and the result of that will be a black hole. Now, a lot of other stuff is going on at the same time. I'm painting a really simple picture, but that's really the gist of it. If a star that's massive enough collapses in on itself after it dies out, then it can form a black hole. Okay, so this does happen in nature. We already know about many black holes. They've been discovered. So this is a very common thing that happens in the universe. Okay, so now that we've seen a little bit about how black holes form, let's talk about the structure of a black hole. So we'll start with the singularity. So remember, we have this tremendous amount of mass from a dead star that begins to collapse in on itself. And it's thought that there's no end to that collapse. It just keeps collapsing until all of that mass is contained in a single point. And we call that point the singularity. So think about it. The mass of a giant star is now contained in a single point. The density of that point is essentially infinite. So you can't get more dense than the singularity of a black hole. Okay, now around the singularity, we have what's called the event horizon. You wanna think of the event horizon as a boundary. Once you cross inside the event horizon, there's no coming back. It is literally impossible to cross back over once you've entered the event horizon. So you're basically done for if you cross into the event horizon because you would have to travel faster than light to get out and that's impossible. If you're on this side of the event horizon, you might be pulled into the black hole, but it's at least possible that you could find a way to escape. So the event horizon is really like a point of no return um, for the black hole. Now the radius of this event horizon, like how big is that radius uh, of the event horizon? Well, that's the Schwarzschild radius that we derived earlier. So anyway, all of this stuff about black holes was kind of just for fun. It's a way we can um, apply the escape speed formula. So none of this is gonna be on the test, just for fun. But uh, it's always interesting to see how we can apply our physics formulas to more novel and interesting cases. Okay, so that's it for the lecture. We've gone through all the content, but I thought we could take some time to go over a couple of practice problems at the end of the lecture. So as a reminder, at the end of every lecture, I have a bunch of slides which contain problems that you can do for practice. Again, these are not things I assign. These are just here to help you study. So the first one is uh, this. We have an object moving in one dimension. So it's moving on the x-axis. And the potential energy of the object is given by this function, u of x, where u is in units of joules and x is in units of meters. So the function is u of x equals x times e to the minus x. So the question is, what is the function that describes the force? What is f of x? And what is the numerical value of the force in newtons when the particle is located at x equals 0.5 meters? So let's work this one out. Okay, so if we wanna find the force given the potential energy, the way we do that is to remember that f of x is equal to minus du dx. So the force is minus the derivative of the potential energy with respect to x. So we have minus the derivative and the potential energy, remember, was x times e to the minus x. So we just have to evaluate that derivative. And the way we're gonna do this is with the product rule because we have a product of two terms. We have x and e to the minus x. So there's an overall negative sign out front. 
when we apply the product rule, we take the first term, which is x, and we take its derivative, which gives us 1. And then we take the second term, and we just leave it alone. Then we add to that the first term, x, just leave it alone, times the derivative of the second term, which is minus e to the minus x. Okay? So overall, uh, when we distribute the negative sign into the brackets, we have minus e to the minus x, and then we have two negative signs in the second term, so we have plus x times e to the minus x. So we could write this as e to the minus x times x minus 1. That would be the force. And of course, if we plug in a specific value of x, 0.5 meters, then what's going to come out of that calculation is the force. So we're going to have e to the minus 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 minus 1, which would give us negative 0 0.30 newtons. So this particular potential energy is completely made up, right? But it's important to know how to take a potential energy function and then find the force. The way you do that is by taking a derivative. That's how this works. And here's another example. I actually took this one from a test that I gave to my physics 45 class maybe two or three years ago. And what's going on here is we have a 30 kilogram block, which is pushed up against the spring. The spring constant is 1.25 times 10 to the five newtons per meter. And we compress the spring by 17.5 centimeters from equilibrium. The block is then released, which sets it into motion. The block initially slides along a frictionless surface but then it encounters a 4.5 meter long rough patch where the coefficient of friction, uh, kinetic friction, is 0.134. So this is the rough patch, it's shown in red here. So there's friction uh, on that rough patch. It then slides up a frictionless ramp which is tilted at an angle of 25 degrees. How far up the ramp does the block go before it slides back down? Let's try to go through this. Okay, so here's what we're dealing with in this problem. In the initial state, the spring is fully compressed. And the block is at rest. So it hasn't been released yet. In the final state, The block is at the top of the ramp. It's at its highest point. OK, so we can certainly say that v initial for the block is 0, because it hasn't started moving yet in the initial state. But it's also true in the final state that v final is equal to 0. The reason for that is, when we reach the highest point, the block momentarily has to come to a stop before it slides back down. Okay, so that's why both V initial and V final are equal to zero. Okay, a little bit of variables that we want to define. X, let's call X the 17.5 centimeter distance the spring gets compressed. And technically it's negative because Compressing the spring is a negative value of x. Stretching out is positive. Also, let's call the length of that rough patch uh, L. So when we see that in our equations, we know it's the length of that rough patch. OK, so here's what we're going to have. Work done by non-conservative forces is equal to delta k plus delta u. The reason I'm using this is because we have friction acting in our system, so we can't assume mechanical energy is conserved. We have to use this equation, uh, this equation instead. Okay, so in the specific case that we're looking at, the work non-conservative is the work done by friction, 
kinetic friction in particular. That's equal to delta K, the change in kinetic energy of the block. But then we have two types of potential energy. We have delta U for gravity and delta U for the spring. Both of those need to be accounted for. So we have these four different terms in our equation. Let's write down what each one of them looks like so we can solve for D. Let's start with delta K. Delta K is zero uh, minus zero because we have no kinetic energy in the final state. We also have no kinetic energy in the initial state. So delta K is just zero. That's easy enough. For delta U, let's say delta U gravity. Well, um, gravitational potential energy is given by MGY. So this would be MGY final minus MGY initial. And let's put the Y axis on the picture here, where this is Y initial at the bottom, and this is Y final up here at the top. And we can set the zero point for our Y axis anywhere we like. So why don't we just say Y initial is equal to zero? That means Y final is gonna to have to be, let's do a little bit of trigonometry. So this height is Y final, the distance on the ramp is D, and this angle we'll just call it theta. Well, sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse or Y final over D, because Y final is the opposite side and D is the hypotenuse, so Y final therefore is equal to D sine theta. And for delta U gravity, we have Mg D sine theta minus zero. That's the change in gravitational potential energy. For the spring, um, here's what we have. So remember, spring potential energy is given by one-half kx squared. But in the final state, the spring is not compressed or stretched out at all, so we have zero potential energy for the final value. Or actually, let me write this this way. Let's say it's one-half k x final squared minus one-half k x initial squared, but we know x final is zero, so we cross that off, and we're just left with minus one half k x initial squared, where this is x initial. That's the 17.5 centimeters. We compress the spring. Eventually, we're going to put that in there. Okay, so there's one more thing to do, which is to state what the work done by friction is. Friction is a constant force, so we can write the work as the force of friction um, over the, here, let's write it this way. It's the force times the distance times cosine of this angle phi, where phi is the angle between force and displacement. Okay? So the force itself, we can calculate it by drawing a free body diagram of the block on the rough patch. So we're gonna have a normal force going up, the weight going down, and this force of kinetic friction going against the motion to the left. That's what the free body diagram looks like when the block is on this rough patch here. Okay, so sum up the forces in the y direction. You'll get m times a y. We have the normal force going up. We have the weight going straight down. And that equals zero because there's no acceleration vertically. It's just moving horizontally. So n is equal to w, which is equal to m times g. The kinetic friction 
is given by mu k times n, which is mu k m times g. Also notice something. The displacement is to the right, but the force of kinetic friction is to the left. So when we plug in the force, we get mu k times mg for the force. The force only acts over this 4.5 meter distance. So I'm going to call that L so we don't confuse it with the distance over here. So we'll call it L. And we have cosine of 180 because, again, the angle between force and displacement is 180. They're in opposite directions. So we have minus mu k mgl. That's the work done by friction. So now we're finally ready to put all of those things together in the energy equation. So we have minus mu k times mgl for the work done by friction. That equals delta k, which is zero, plus delta u gravity, which is mgd sine theta. We found that earlier. We also found that delta u for the spring is minus one half k x initial squared. We're trying to find d, the distance the block goes up the ramp. So to solve for that, we'll have mg times d times sine theta equal to a half times kx initial squared. So we move that over to the other side, minus mu k mgl. Okay, now we solve for d by dividing out mg sine theta on both sides. So I'm going to have kx initial squared divided by 2 mg sine theta minus mu k times l. If I divide out mg, uh, if I divide out mg, it cancels the mg here. So I just have sine theta on the bottom. Okay, that's kind of a lot, but that's the expression we can now plug the numbers into. So k is equal to 1.25, 10 to the fifth kilograms per second squared. And then x initial is negative 17.5 centimeters or 0.175 meters. We'll square that. Divide by two times the mass, 30 kilograms. G, 9.8 meters per second squared, and then sine of 25 degrees. Subtract mu k, which is one point, sorry, uh, 0.134 times L, which is 4.5 meters, and then divide by sine of 25. Okay, that's a lot, but if you do that calculation, you will get the number, which is 13.98 meters, which rounds off to three sig figs to one, or sorry, 14.0 uh, meters. Yeah, there it is. So that's how this one works. This is kind of a, a complex problem, but it's a good one to do for practice. And so we'll end the lecture here. Uh, and that's it for chapter eight. I'll see you in the next video when we'll start, uh, we'll start chapter nine. So until then, uh, take care, be safe out there. See you later.